Welcome to the CAEA Live Discussion. Grab your Bibles. We will begin shortly. Welcome to the CAEA Live Discussion. Grab your Bibles. We will begin shortly. Welcome to the CAEA Live Discussion. Grab your Bibles. We will begin shortly. Welcome to the CAEA Live Discussion. Grab your Bibles. We will begin shortly. All right, good evening and praise the Lord, everyone. Good evening and praise the Lord to everyone. Let's take a few minutes to greet each other and let everyone know you're here in the chat box. And then we'll get started. Hopefully you all are doing well. Hopefully you've had a great day. And we're looking forward to seeing everyone and getting into a very good study this evening. So let's take a few minutes to greet each other and then, then we'll get started. All right, let me set one other thing up. All right. All right, we hope you all are doing well. Praise the Lord, Sister Stevens. Praise the Lord, Sister Neely. Praise the Lord, Aunt Jeanette. Good to see you. Thank you all for being here tonight. It's a pleasure to join and get into this study. And we hope you all are doing well. Hopefully, you've been able to um, have a great weekend. It is almost Monday again, and we're not complaining, though. Uh, we're always thankful that God blesses us to make it from week to week. So we're not going to complain, right? Um, but it's always good to enjoy some time off and uh, enjoy the weekend. So I'm, I'm always thankful for that. And I'm especially thankful that God gives us the opportunity to study and and read and fellowship together through Scripture. I mean, that is such a tremendous um, thing to to engage in. And I think we should always... I really think it should be considered a priority, you know, um, for all of us. Um, I, I actually had a chance to speak to someone who um, did missionary work in translating the Bible for indigenous tribes. And uh, one of the things that they t explained to me is that the difficulty of translating is doing so in a language that doesn't have um, a complete vocabulary. Or doesn't have enough of the vocab vocabulary developed to translate the Bible with the proper understanding. So it's not just translating the Bible, it's translating the Bible and developing the language that uh, a trans translator would engage in in that line of work. And I, I just thought that that was incredible. And I never realized just how much work goes into that. So we're here in the United States. We have a Bible in our hands and um, we can understand it. And so I'm thankful for that. Let's go ahead and grant some congratulations here. All right. We are reading the entire Bible. We've made it quite a ways through. This week, we're going into the book of Jeremiah. Last week, we finished um, uh, Second Chronicles. We finished um, Zephaniah. And so we are we are making our way through this this narrative. And I'm Really excited about everything. I don't think we finished. Let me see. Um, I'm excited about everything that we've been able to read so far. We've got one more chapter left in Second Chronicles. And so we'll finish that off. But we, we're we making our way through here and just excited about everything that God is doing in that, in that reading. And hopefully you all are enjoying everything as well. All right. So um, let's go ahead and get into this. We have a lot to cover. This is one of the big chapters, as you all know. Um, whenever we 
decided to take on the book of Ezekiel, we knew we were walking into some very challenging texts and some very difficult uh, passages. And I, I think, you know, that's something that we want to always respect. Um, we don't know everything, obviously. Uh, and the beauty of studying the Bible is taking every opportunity year by year to learn more and more about the passage. And that's that's what I'm about. Uh, that's what I would encourage us all, all to do. Um, we are by no means experts. We never will be, to be honest with you. Um, and that's OK. The goal is to get what we can so that we can understand what we need to understand in order to live the sort of lives that God has uh, desired for us to live. And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to continue to study and Lord willing, we'll get all we can in this life, all that is needed in this life. And, and uh, Lord willing, we'll be able to become better people in the process. All right. So um, praise the Lord, uh, Sister Smith. Good to see you. Uh, praise the Lord, Sister Flagler. Good to see you guys. Um, praise the Lord, Janet. I'm not sure if I spoke to you. Good to see you all. Praise the Lord, Sister Graves. Good to see you. Thank you for being with us tonight. All right, Sister Smith, please uh, let Elder Smith know I said happy birthday. All right. Um, definitely want to celebrate his birthday today and hope he's enjoying it uh, as much as, as he deserves. So, all right. So let's get into this, um, this study. Last week, we went into Ezekiel chapter 38 and we saw in chapter 38 that there was this conspiracy among the nations to come against the people of God after returning to the nation, or should I say, returning to Jerusalem. This has often been used as a way of sort of suggesting that there is a modern conspiracy against the people of God or even against modern day Israel uh, that will lead to some sort of Armageddon or some sort of war um, that, um, that, that, we should expect in our time and obviously there are all sorts of things we can do to try to interpret and draw parallels our goal here tonight is to try to figure out how do we understand the text and then how do we understand the way the text was used by the apostles now i often say this we don't have to and i, I say this very um uh, very carefully because one of the things that i've discovered is that in our reading of the bible um the Bible is so well put together by the spirit, the spirit motivating its words that we don't necessarily have to figure out how to read it. It shows us how to read it based on how the writers used other texts. OK, and I am very careful not to exploit that and to maintain the way that they used it and particularly what they used to convey a particular message. OK. And what we're going to find tonight is that uh, the Apostle John in the revelation of Jesus Christ depended, or should I say, referenced language out of Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39 to convey to the audience that he was speaking to things that would happen to them. All right. So let's get into that. I'm sorry. Let me fix something here. All right. And so we want to see that we want to we want to kind of picture that and pick that up tonight. And hopefully I can uh, we have enough time to get into it as, as much as I would like. All right. Praise the Lord, Mama. Good to see you tonight. Thank you for joining us. All right. Let's get into this. Um, let's see if I can get all this pulled up here. All right. All right. Here we go. So let's turn our Bibles to Ezekiel chapter thirty nine. Last week, we looked at Ezekiel chapter 38, which is we found the first mention of Gog and Magog and all these different characters who are present. And now we are trying to see in chapter 39 what's going to happen to them, because there's been a prophecy that God is against them. There's also been a prophecy that God is going to fight against them. And chapter 39 basically goes into detail of what that would look like and how that will come to pass. So notice what happens in chapter 39, verse one. Uh, he says here, as for you, son of man, prophesy against Gog. Remember, Gog is some sort of reference to a, a leader. We don't necessarily know who the leader is, but we can kind of wrap our mind on who it could be. OK, um, 
and, and, and I won't say it that way. That's misleading. We can wrap our mind on what that leader would look like and what they will do. What do they represent is what I'm meaning to say. What does this leader represent? And what we can say is that Gog represents the individual that will make an attempt to collaborate with various nations that will come from the north to overthrow the people of God in the land of God. Now, we do know that Babylon in various passages are refer is referred to as the land from the north. OK, um, however, this is post. The uh, exile and this is referencing coming back into ex, uh, the land of Israel. So Babylon wouldn't necessarily be the one who would fit the picture, but it would be a good reference point. All right. So Gog, we're going to just say here, Gog is a person or a leader. All right. Leader that conspires against the people of God. Now, I want us to be careful not to fall in what they call dualism. There's this argument that there's good versus evil, God against the devil, okay? And I don't want to make this to seem as if God is fighting against the devil. God doesn't fight against anyone, okay? God does not fight against anyone. What the devil does, what Satan has done is because he cannot fight against God, he fights against the people of God. We become the target because God cannot be fought against. He is God and the devil knows that uh, God is powerful and the devil is aware of his power. But he tries to frustrate God's plan and tries to frustrate what God is intending to do through people. And so what we see through scripture is not the sort of God versus the devil, but more importantly, the devil versus mankind. All right. The, de the devil, Satan against mankind. And this is how God shows his power and his victory. He does so by stopping the works of Satan against mankind. All right. Um, particularly his people. So Gog is a chief prince, which is to say a ruler. He is a, a leader. And the reason he is acknowledged is because of how he will orchestrate the alliance that will fight against the people of God. OK. Now, notice this. I will turn you around, drive you on and lead you up from the remotest parts of the north. This is the reference that ties this link for most people to Babylon. But remember, the difference here is that Babylon has already come. OK, so we're not referencing Babylon. We're representing or we're referencing this reference in particular is for towards a person or people who are like Babylon. They are strong like Babylon. They are uh, capable like Babylon, but they are not. It's not Babylon. All right. So we can put here like Babylon. OK, it represents a military force, it represents a collaborative effort of varying nations uh, as identified in this text. All right. And so the reference like North puts the audience in the frame of mind of what they would have seen in Babylon, that nation, that, that empire that came against them and just destroyed them right before they were able to return back. Notice what he says. I will bring you against the mountains of Israel. And he says, then I will knock your bow from your left hand and make your arrows drop from your right hand. Now, the thing that's so beautiful and so important about this text is the descriptive nature of how Ezekiel is prophesying and speaking to what God will do to the enemies. Now, what I want you to do in your Bibles or in your notes is I want you to draw, or should I say write, next to this chapter, Revelation chapter 20. Okay, Revelation chapter 20. And what we will see is that when God is speaking to John, he is saying to him, John, what I did to Gog and Magog, I'm going to do to Satan and I'm going to do it to hell. All right. Because the enemies of mankind, the enemies of God's family is death, hell and Satan. All right. And so they, th when John is referencing this and he's bringing up Gog and Magog and he's bringing up 
these references, the persons who would have received these letters, those in Asia Minor, by the way, the places that were mentioned in Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39 are along the Asia Minor. He is saying to them, guys, I'm going to do to your enemies in the spiritual realm what I did to Israel's enemies in the physical realm. All right. So so we are learning how to read like the first century would have read. OK, they would have took a natural, a physical event and interpreted it spiritually because what God does in the spirit has been done already in the natural. All right. And that's the way they would have used scripture. This is a key way to understand how to read and interpret scripture. OK, we do it the way the apostles did it. We look at how they reference different passages and we say to ourselves, if they use that passage that way, then we know we can use that passage the same way and we can go and understand it the way that they understood it. All right. I love to use their methods because their methods are tried and true. And more importantly, they're inspired. OK, so notice what he says here. He says this. Then I will knock down your bow from your left hand and make your arrows drop from the right hand. Think about all that God is doing or said he would do against Babylon. And God is saying, here, I'm going to do it again against this enemy that's going to come against you. You all are troops and the peoples who are with you will fall on the mountains of Israel. So you see here, there's an army. OK, we want to pay attention to that. There's a diverse group of people. All right. We want to pay attention to that. And he says, they're going to fall with you. All those people you're bringing with you, I'm going to cause them to fall. I will give you as food to every kind of predatory bird and to the wild animals. Look at the language that is being used here. I'm going to feed you to the scavengers. I'm going to allow you to be, as you might imagine in today's world, roadkill. All right. Every beast of the field is going to come and feed upon you. Now, the graphic nature by which this prophecy is given is intended to lead to a more spiritual definition. The spirit is wise. And, and, and we have to always think about it this way. These are not just men writing. The spirit is actually motivating these words. He's inspiring these words. He's speaking through these men so that they can understand what they should un, should know for their time. But God is forward thinking. God is thinking to the future and he knows he's going to have a prophet or an apostle that is going to use this information to depict to hit their own generation what message they need to understand for their time. OK, and so let me just say this about prophecy. Prophecy is taking real events that have happened in history. And interpreting them by the spirit so that we can have a more definitive understanding of what is going on in our own world. You see, it doesn't take the spirit to cognitively understand the Bible because God wrote it so that anybody can read it and comprehend it. But it does take the spirit to read the Bible comprehensively, receive and accept everything that is written and then interpret your entire life and interpret the world through the lens of understanding that is given to you by the Holy Spirit. You see, the reason why we're here tonight and not somewhere doing something else is because our understanding of Scripture through the help of the Holy Spirit has helped us to understand that it is valuable to our lives to get into this book, understand it, read it, comprehend it and then apply it. That's why we're here tonight. The only difference between us and someone else who may not have the same conviction is that they have not come to value the word of God. And essentially, they have not come to value, if you will, the uh, importance of having a devout relationship, a personal relationship with them. I was listening to someone just recently and they were talking about some of the greatest evangelists in the world. And he said, you know, guys, we make this more complicated than it ought to be. He said the reason why, the, you know, great men did great things, great women did great things is because not because they were so special, but the difference is they they fell in love with God. He said it's not rocket science. They just they wanted more of God. They fell in love with God and every chance that they could get, they use an opportunity to get closer to God. And as they served, that was actually that was actually manifested in their ministries. And so tonight, what we're doing is we're valuing the word of God. The, the spirit is the spirit is helping us see the value of what is written so that we might live through that conviction. All right. 
So let's go a little further. Let's look at what else he says in verse in verse uh, five. He says, you will fall on the open field for I have spoken. This is the declaration of the Lord God. He's going to cause them to fall. Now he says, now catch this, y'all. This is important. I will send fire. Okay. Fire is a common reference to some sort of destruction. Okay. It is a symbol of wrath and we shouldn't ever forget it. Okay. Every time we see fire, though it could have different meanings, we should always think, Hmm, this could very well be a symbol of wrath. OK, we should take that in, into consideration. And mo more times than not, it's going to be the case where fire is a symbol of wrath. Think about uh, 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 Sodom and Gomorrah. OK, think about Jerusalem being burned up. Think about all the different times that God used fire to destroy. Anytime you see the word he's trying to convey my wrath is going to bring destruction and it is something that you should definitely be concerned about. So the city, just like all the other cities, is going to be burned. And those who live securely on the coast and islands, they will be burned along with it. And then they will know that I am the Lord. OK, now I'm going to say this. What we're reading is the ram are the ramifications of of a people who decided they were going to bully the people of God. And if you have not recognized it yet, out of all the things that we've read so far, God does not take too kindly to his people being bullied. He takes that extremely personal. I mean, he really, really has a problem with that. He, 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 he makes sure he has every opportunity or he takes advantage of every opportunity when the people of God are being bullied rather by the nations, rather by some other group. It doesn't matter. God takes it personally and God always responds to people, his people being bullied and taken advantage of. God does not allow that to go on. Now, here's the issue. Here's the, 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 the tension, if you will. The tension is sometimes the people of God have placed themselves in a position to be bullied. Meaning they have done something so wrong, so uh, filled with iniquity that God has to react to their sins by the hand of other individuals. But be careful that you do not fall in the position where you are taking advantage of God's tolerance and permission to use you as a means of correcting his people. Because the moment you do that, that is the moment you become in trouble with God. And that's what's going on here. You see, we're going to read at the end of this chapter that Israel was in exile, but God did it to punish them and chastise them, not to destroy them. And that is the goodness of God in this whole uh, story between God, uh, a story about God and Israel, that, that he's, he's fervent. I mean, should I say he's consistent in chastisement, but he's not destructive. He's not meaning to harm his people. And, and that is the, I, agree, I think, the greatest expression of justice that I can ever think of, the ability to chastise without destroying. All right. There's a fine line that God walks there and uh, no one does it as good as he does. All right. So let's look a little further. <clears throat> he says, so I will make my holy name known among the people of Israel and will no longer allow it to be profaned. All right. We saw Ezekiel talking about this. You know, God is going to embarrass his people. He's going to make sure everyone knows that they were the ones who turned their back on him. It was an embarrassment for sure. All right. It was a total embarrassment. All right. Uh, praise the Lord. Aunt Bessie, good to see you. Uh, praise the Lord, Smith. Oh, it's a pleasure. I'm glad you're enjoying your birthday. Uh, praise the Lord, Sister Martin. Good to see you tonight. Thank you all for joining us. All right. Good to have everybody here tonight. Let's keep on reading. All right. It says now, yes, it is coming and it will happen. All right. It is coming and it will happen. This thing is going to happen. And he says, this is the declaration of the Lord God. This is the day I have spoken about. Now, remember last week, and I want you to put next to this verse, verse eight. We read in Ezekiel chapter 38 that God has spoken about this by the prophets prior. All right. He had spoken about this by the previous prophets. If I can find that verse really quick, I'll. I think it's in verse 18. Oh, verse 17. Yeah, in verse 17, right beside 39 and 8, 
Ezekiel chapter 38 and verse 17. Because God is saying here, I've been speaking about this. I've been warning you about this and it's about to happen. So put your seatbelts on. Understand what's happening. This is going to happen just as I said it would. All right. The interesting thing about this whole situation is, is that God had been speaking through other prophets, but never mentioned the name Gog or Magog. OK, so it helps us to understand that this is a, a function that God is talking about in this prophecy, the function of hostility that comes against the people of God, even after God re, uh, restores them. Um, I, I like to think about it this way. Just because we get saved doesn't mean the battle stops. It keeps going on and on and on and on. And people keep coming against the people of God. But that's OK. God has a way of showing up and restoring. And we have to we have to believe in that. If we don't believe in anything else, we have to believe in that because uh, Lord knows the, the battle doesn't stop. All right. It keeps on and it is that the enemy is fervent. But the ultimate end is that God defeats Satan. And he conquers him and removes him completely. That's what John is getting at. And John, in Revelation chapter 20, he is getting at the ultimate victory over Satan for the people of God. And this is a symbol of that. This is a shadow of what will come through Jesus Christ. All right. So let's go a little further here. Let's see what else is, is in this chapter. He says, now, then the inhabitants of Israel's cities will go out, kindle fires and burn the weapons. Now, remember, we said last week. The nation of Israel won't be fighting in this war. You see, this is a war that God wins by his own authority, by his own hand, he, without the use of, of the people of God's involvement. It is a sort of exodus experience, if you will, where uh, the Israelites left Egypt, never, ever actually picking up a sword to fight. How beautiful is that where you can win and don't fight? It's kind of like what Jehoshaphat was saying, you know, uh, this battle's not ours it's the lord's uh we don't need to fight in this one and i'm going to say to us tonight some battles we got to fight in but let me tell you always recognize which battles god is calling calling you to fight in because not every battle is meant for you to take up arms sometimes god wants to allow you to sit back and watch the action sometimes god will allow the enemy to self-destruct he will allow the enemy to overthrow themselves and in this particular situation, look at verse nine. He says, then the inhabitants of Israel cities will go out, kindle fires and burn the weapons. They're not going to take the weapons and start fighting. They're going to take those weapons and they're going to burn them. The small and the large shields and bows and arrows, the clubs and spears for seven years, they will use them to make fires. There's all sorts of symbolic language here, just like it is in the book of Revelation. The year seven, referencing completion, finality, the the 1000 years representing, as some will argue, the year of Jubilee. You see, these numbers are helping us to think through what messages are being received. OK, so we have to know. And again, think like the prophets, think like the people of the time. That takes a lot of discipline. I'm not going to um, and, and a lot of studying. Um but but it's possible. And that's the duty of a student. Right. So that's the beauty of studying and reading the Bible over and over and over and over again. All right. So let's keep reading. All right. Let's look at here. Look at this in verse uh, 10. He says in verse 10, they will not gather wood from the countryside or cut it down from the forest, for they will use the weapons to make fires. They will take the loot from those who looted them and plunder those who plundered them. This is the declaration of the Lord God. Now I want you to, I want you to imagine this. Imagine in being in Jerusalem, all these nations. Imagine this in the 21st century where we have social media and we have news networks. Imagine being here in America and I'm just putting this in perspective. I'm not saying this is the way we should think about this text, but I want to put this in perspective. Imagine being in America and you get a report that the nations of the world are collaborating to come against America. And you have all the most powerful Nations coming together in an alliance to take America because we are we have been away, but we have been granted access to come back home and we're trying to rebuild this thing. And we've determined that we're going to start over again. Well, as we get back here, we we receive news 
that all these different nations have formed an alliance and they want to come in against us. Now, imagine there being a word from the Lord saying, guys, don't worry. Don't you worry one bit. I saw this coming a long time ago and I knew they would do this. And I have already prepared to overcome them and to defeat them myself. Don't you worry one bit. It's not going to be up to you to handle this one. I'm going to allow my power to overthrow these nations because they are not coming against you. They are coming against me. You see, this prophecy is not meant to be one of terror and neither is the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation is not meant to scare us. It's meant to comfort us by helping us see that God in a very difficult time made an oath to his people to take care of them and to provide for them and to overcome the enemy that was striking them with his own hand. And it is to show us that if God did that for them, brothers and sisters, he will do it for us. When you understand the Bible, the wisest thing that you can do is use it to guide your prayers. I've learned and I am learning day and night to pray the scriptures. I'm learning to say, Lord, your word has said that whenever Israel got in trouble, Whenever Israel got in, into a mess, you went out and got them. When Israel was in bondage, you freed them. When Israel had a circumstance that they couldn't fight or, or get the victory over themselves, you made a way for them. And I'm learning to do the same and pray and ask God what you did for them. Please do that for me. Now, here's the thing that I've learned. God will not. Un he will not honor our interpretation of his word. He will not honor what we think his word is saying, but God will absolutely honor what his word is intended to convey to those who will read it. He will respect his absolute message. He will he will respect and honor what he spoke from his prophets, the way that he spoke it. And if we learn to pray that boy, our lives will be filled with the power of God in a way we've never experienced before. OK, God will honor his word. It will accomplish what he set out for it to accomplish. And so this is powerful to see this. And now we can apply this in our lives and say, Lord, here it is. Here, here we are. We're, we're, we're seeing you. We've heard you have done this before. Can you do this for us too? Now, look at what he says. Now, on that day, I will give Gog a burial place. Now, this I want you to put here. Uh, th there, there is a play of words here. And I want you to highlight this little phrase here, the Traveler's Valley. Okay, that's pretty interesting thing. The word Gehenna, which is the Greek word for hell, means the Valley of Hinnom. OK, and what is going on here is there's a, a sort of play on words, if you will, because he's drawing to the to the minds of those who are reading it, who would have been very familiar with the Valley of Hinnom, Hinnom because this valley is mentioned in Jeremiah. And they would burn all the refuse or, or the refuse or the dead bodies. And in fact, they would offer their children in this valley to be burned to false gods. And so what he's saying here in a way is that I'm going to cause the burial site to be a valley full of dead bodies. OK, now now you might say, oh, my gosh, this is so just so graphic. But I want you to see what the writer is trying to convey. He's trying to convey how God is going to overthrow. OK, he's going to overthrow this nation and, and the most, you know, brutal way, if you will. It's not going to be a pretty sight, which is why when we get into John chapter 20 or excuse me, Revelation chapter 20, we begin to imagine things that are all just terrifying. But if you it's not meant to terrify the modern reader, it's meant to draw your attention back to a particular place in Scripture to convey a particular message. All right. The the absolute promise that God is going to finally overthrow the enemies of Israel. And that's that's what's intended to be understood. I just can't. And I hope I'm not beating a dead horse, but I want you to feel comfortable reading the book of Revelation. I want us to read the book of Revelation, not with fear, but with hope. OK, the book of Revelation is meant to be a book of hope. It's only meant to be a, a book of fear for those who ain't on the on the Lord's side. All right. But if you're on the Lord's side, you should be Praying like they prayed at the end of the book. Come, Lord Jesus, come even now. In other, in other words, they're saying, God, what's taking you so long? You can you can start this any day now. 
because we know whenever you start this, we will be protected. All right. It's a totally different message from the one we see conveyed in Hollywood on these TV shows and on these movies. You know, <laughs> that's another <laughs> that's pretty. That's another story. We'll talk about that maybe some other time. But he says, now look at this valley. He says this traveler's valley. It will block those who travel through for Gog and his hordes will be buried there. All right. This is where it's going to be their burial, their, their um, place of burial. And so it will be called hordes of Gog Valley. And you can if you were to look at that word in Hebrew, you'll see the play on words there. Um, it's very close to Gehenna. Um, but the picture is very present and very obvious. This is not going to be a, a pretty sight. It's going to be, if you will, the worst type of terror that you could probably witness on this side of earth. He says the house of Israel will spend seven months burying them in order to cleanse the land. Could you imagine that? Now, now, if you can just imagine how dramatic this is right here, uh, what John is trying to say, this is what God is going to do to the devil. God is going to def defeat the devil this same way. He's going to overthrow Satan this same way. Just as they had to bury these bodies for seven months, God is going to destroy and pollute and overthrow Satan and his army in the same way. Now, why would they want to convey that message? Why would they want why would they need that message in, in, in the book of Revelation? Well, you do understand that Satan doesn't show up in the body. He's not here present like in a body so that I can say, hey, you, Satan, come here. No, Satan he, he presents himself, himself through people, thrones, dominions, systems. And I always tell people this. I've been saying this for the last three weeks because it just finally clicked. Two forms and two systems that the enemy, that Satan, the adversary, the devil, however you want to refer to him. Two systems that he used most prevalently, most uh, prevalently is government and religion. And you can see in the New Testament how Satan was using government and religion to overthrow and to keep the people of God in bondage. He used those two systems by using people to oppress and to bind the people of God so that they could not use their lives to serve the purpose of God. And so if you can think about being in, in, in Asia, the church of Thyatira or being in the church of Samaria or the church of Ephesus, and you're reading this book that John is writing, revealing what is going to happen. They wouldn't just be saying, finally, this evil force that keeps antagonizing me is going to be put to death. They would have imagined the people that he's using. The systems that he has been using, the structures and the institutions that have been used by Satan, not only will Satan be destroyed, but those will be destroyed with him. And finally, we are going to have the opportunity to worship the Lord in a beautiful way, in the way that he always intended. And we will live our lives free. Without oppression without struggle, without fight, without strife, we will finally be delivered from those oppressive systems. This is a powerful uh, uh, testimony. And this is why, uh, believe it or not, everything that's being written is being written in a code so that people who would pick up the book without the understanding of scripture, they won't understand it. It's kind of like in slavery, they would sing Messages, sing songs, Negro spirituals. They were messages, the encoded messages sung by those who understood the language. And the book of Revelation is just that for people who understood the book or who read the book, who could read and understand Old Testament. They knew exactly what he what John was saying. They knew when he referenced Satan, he was really saying. The Roman Empire is coming down. The systems of Judaism, they're coming down. They won't be here. Government and religion, they're coming down because Satan is being destroyed and everything that Satan uses will be destroyed with it. 
God is binding the strong man and he's going to overthrow everything that is challenged and opposed the people of God. Man, you could you understand? Do you know how well and how long the churches in Asia would have shouted after hearing this message? I mean, they are, they're not going through the little simple stuff we go through. Their children are being taken from them. Their homes are being destroyed. They're being sent out of cities, being imprisoned. They're being beaten. They're being killed. And the prophet says, don't worry. <laughs> Satan is going to be destroyed and everything that Satan uses will be destroyed with him. That's a powerful message to tell people who are slaves and in bondage and who don't have the right to practice their religion and freedom. That's a strong message. And that's what God shared with them. All right. Let's keep moving. And this is essentially what God is saying through Ezekiel to the house of Israel. Don't you worry. I'm going to take care of this. This is going to be just fine. OK, so let, look a little further. All the people of the land will bury them and their fame will spread. He says, on the day I display my glory. And he says, this is the declaration of the Lord God. They will appoint men on a full time basis to pass through the land and bury the invaders who remain on the surface of the ground in order to cleanse it. They will make their search at the end of the seven months. So you can understand just by the, the length of time it would take to bury this army. You can tell that it would take that there were a lot of people that came against them. You see, there's this saying that people have. You know, you're at the break of a breakthrough or at the brink of a breakthrough when you have several attacks coming out of nowhere. You see. God is saying you're not going to walk into this deliverance. You're going to have to you're going to have to endure until this deliverance comes. Now, what you think about the entire New Testament? Jesus comes into the earth. The earth does not receive Jesus, but Jesus comes and he attracts to him a remnant of believers. Those who get it, those who hear the message and believe and those who who believe Unfortunately, we're victims to two things, government and religion. As we see it in the, old, in the New Testament, Rome was OK with anybody practicing whatever religion they want to practice as long as they honor the king. It just so happens that believers in honoring the king, they cannot honor God. So to honor the to honor God would mean to dishonor the king because God is king, not Rome, not Caesar. But then on the other side of that, there's this religious idea that if I am on the Lord's side, then I must not be committed to the religious traditions. I must follow the new way. And it was oppressive. It was dangerous. But this is what God was doing when he opened up a new way, a new life, a new world, a new creation. Because Paul would say, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. The actual word there is creation. He's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things come new. New creation was breaking in, but this is what the Christians soon learned. The Christians soon learned that new creation doesn't come easy. Freshness doesn't come easy. Freshness comes with struggle. The kingdom suffereth violence and the violent taketh it by force. There was struggle. There was tension. And even though the Savior has arrived, deliverance wasn't going to come as though it was a walk in the park. Deliverance would come at a price. It would come at a cost. And now they're seeing that in order to receive what God wants them to have, they have to endure something. This is why God says that it will be hard times. It will be such difficult times that even the very elect would be deceived. This is what he's speaking about. He's saying, guys, don't think that this will come without a struggle. For all of us here tonight, who may feel like you're struggling, may feel like it wasn't worth it, <laughs> may feel like you shouldn't have made the decision to follow Christ. I'm going to tell you tonight, that feeling is proof that better days are ahead. That feeling is proof that you made the right decision because deliverance never comes with ease. Victory doesn't come without a fight. Victory doesn't come without the forces of Satan trying to overthrow you. And what we see all throughout scripture from not only this book in this text in Ezekiel, 
not only in the book of Revelation, but from the start of the book of Matthew, hell gets very upset and it strikes its first blow when they know and they become aware that Jesus has stepped foot in the earth because they know they only have a short period of time. This is what we find in Revelation 20. You see, God gave Satan a period of time to re to, to do his thing. And after that, it was over. So he gave it his best shot. All right. Thanks, Dad, for being with us. Dad is on YouTube. I appreciate you for being with us tonight. All right. Let's go a little further. I, I, I will get stuck on this and I don't want to do that. Now, he says they will appoint men a full time basis. So you can see how many people were coming. They had to hire people to bury uh, people in on a full time basis, which is. Uh, and I mean, I can't imagine that. It says when they pass through the land and one of them sees a human bone, he will set up a marker next to it until the buriers have buried it in the hordes of Gog Valley. I wanted to say this, the references that God has to hell has this in mind. OK, um, Jesus talked about hell in the New Testament more than anybody. OK, Jesus talked about hell more than anybody in the New Testament. And I want us to put a, a, a trigger in our mind that as we're thinking about hell in its eternal state, think about what it would look like for hell to be on earth. Because let me, let me say it this way. Jesus taught thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The reality of being a Christian is that we get a little taste of heaven on earth. But for those who are not believers, would you believe and would you receive on tonight that they get a little bit of hell on earth too? You see, hell doesn't start when you die. You get a little taste of it here on earth. And if people understood that, they will act better on earth without thinking that they can escape hell if they get things right at the end of their lives so they can get on in heaven. So you ought to understand that God doesn't just wait until you die to punish you. God will start this thing on earth. All right. If I can get a little bit, bit of heaven on earth, like Paul says, we're seated in heavenly places. Rest assured, you can surely get a little bit of hell on earth, too. It doesn't start when we die. It can start right here. And it does. This is what God is saying through this prophet. I'm not going to wait until they die. It's going to start here and it's going to continue on through eternity. Now, notice what he says. Now, there will be a city named Hamona there. So they will cleanse the land. You got to get all those dead people out of there, he says. Notice he says, son of man, this is what the Lord God says. Tell every kind of bird and all the wild animals assemble and come. My goodness. Could you imagine the sight of this? All the scavengers of the world are sitting there eating from this valley. You know, um, I was driving the other day and there was this something dead in the road and a, a buzzard was there. There's two of them. And the buzzard was obviously so aware and so used to eating in the field or eating on the road that when I drove up, he just stepped aside and let me pass on through instead of flying off. And I was irritated just at those two buzzards. Could you imagine? And, and I'll, I'm just going to say this, that little fragment of an animal brought two buzzards to it. Could you imagine what it would look like? For an entire valley to have this many dead people and all the beasts of the field and animals are coming just feeding off of this valley of dead, dead humans. It's not a pretty sight. It's not a pretty sight, not for those who are unbelievers anyway. But it's exactly what would happen to those who came against God's people. And though I am sure, perhaps, maybe not, I don't know, though I'm sure there are some people there saying, God, please don't do this. This is not the way. It would have been a sense of assurance to those who were being oppressed that God is going to make such a mighty move among them to this extent. All right. Assemble and come gather from all around to my sacrificial feast. Look at this. Look at what he calls it a sacrificial feast. And it's his sacrificial feast. That's what he says. That I am slaughtering for you. 
I am slaughtering a feast for you, you wild animals and birds, a great feast on the mountains of Israel. You will eat flesh and drink blood. Man, that's tough. You will eat the flesh of mighty men, those who were powerful. All right, those who were full of valor, those who were thought to be unbeatable. You're going to eat their flesh and drink the blood of the earth's. Look at this word, princes, their authorities. All right, rams, lambs, male goats, and all the fattened bulls of Bashan. You're going to eat all of them. Not only are you going to eat their bodies, but you're going to eat their stuff too. This is pretty heavy, y'all. I'm telling you, my goodness. Y'all, if, if, if Ezekiel, y'all type in the chat box, could y'all could y'all stand Ezekiel preaching? <laughs> I don't think I could stand. I'd be like, man, this man, this guy here. <laughs> I used to hear people say, um, I can take it, preach it. You can talk, talk. Uh, you don't have to sugarcoat it for me. I don't think we thought about Ezekiel when we started saying stuff like that. This fellow here. It's tough to handle. I'm telling you, my goodness. <laughs> All right, let's look a little further. Here. Look at this. He says you will eat fat until you are satisfied and drink blood until you are drunk. At my sacrificial feast that I have prepared for you, this is what you will do. At my table, you will eat your fill of horses and riders. Now, look at this. See, they were coming with horses and riders. See, people think because they got natural weapons. They can win a spiritual war. Let me tell you something. Never bring a natural weapon to a spiritual war. You will never win. Never bring a natural weapon to a spiritual war. There is no battle that a gun can win. When prayer is the weapon that God intends, there's no weapon that a knife can win whenever God has intended for the word of God to be the weapon of use. You see, it would have been a setup. It would have been a, a, a tragedy if the nation of Israel would have fought against this nation with literal weapons. And the mistake that they made is they brought these weapons to Israel thinking that they can overthrow Israel because they didn't have the natural weapons that they had. They didn't have the resources, but God helps us to see. You don't need that stuff when you got me. You don't need a gun when you have me. You might be mighty with your with your gun or with your knife or whatever you brought brought your horses and your riders who are trained and spent their life learning how to do war. But you're not a match for my God. And notice what he says. I will display my glory among the nations and all the nations catch this. All the nations will see. It's almost like the finale. It's kind of like, you know, there's been this long taunt, this ongoing idea that God, Israel's God is not powerful. Well, here's the big showdown. And everyone will see that Israel's God is most powerful. And that they will they will also see that the nations will see the judgment I have executed. Excuse me. And the hand I have laid. I have laid on them. It's going to be without a doubt. That Israel's God came through. It says from that day forward, the house of Israel will know. Now, catch this part. This is the part that's most interesting to me, because there's two messages in this action, in this activity. There's a message to the nations and there's an, a, a message to Israel. The nations will know that Israel's God is the Lord and Israel will know that their God is the Lord. It says from that day forward, the house of Israel will know that I am the Lord, their God. And the nations will know that the house of Israel. Now catch this. This is the important part. When the nation of Israel went into exile. They did so on the account of their iniquity. And they did it because they dwelt unfaithfully with me. You see, he's saying this when I sent them to these nations to be exiled, it was because there was a circumstance. Well, the first circumstance was this. They had iniquity. The second circumstance was they were unfaithful. I hid my face from them and handed them over to their enemies. Here's the big reason. So that they could fall by the sword. 
He did this for a reason. And unfortunately, Israel or the nations don't understand what's going on here. They're taking advantage of the situation. It's a terrible mistake. It is the critical mistake. Now, notice what he says. I dealt with them according to their uncleanness and transgressions, and I hid my face from them. Notice this. But now I'm going to restore. You see, what God was doing here is he was chastising. All right. I want you to write from verse 23 all the way down to 29 chastisement. See, this was not meant to be destructive. This was meant to be chastising. And if you can think about what that looks like, think about for a moment how you do your children. Some of us have different forms of punishment. I won't go into the various forms we might use. But one thing we do know is that there's a very broad difference between destroying and chastising. We don't intend to destroy our children, but we do intend to correct them. And what God is saying here is when I meant to correct them, you tried to destroy them. Aren't you glad tonight that God intervenes whenever people mistake chastisement for destruction? You see, we are not like God, and, I, and I'm so glad we're not. Or God is not like us. I put it that way. And I'm glad he's not because people will destroy you. But God will take the time to try to correct you. And I will say this with my hands, both of my hands up. I will firmly admit that there have been times when I deserve to be destroyed. But I'm so glad. (laughs) I am so glad that my God chose to chastise me. Did it hurt? Oh, you best believe it hurt. Oh, you best believe it hurt worse than it could have. Anything else could have ever hurt. It hurt. Did it hurt? Boy, it hurt. But I'm it was so much better than being destroyed. I can tell you that. See, if we think we can't handle chastisement, there are no words to put into into comprehension what it would be like to be destroyed. We just can't fathom that. It's really nothing that we can really equate to being destroyed. We are here tonight because God saw fit to chastise us rather than to destroy us. And that is a good, that's a good thing to know that we have a father like that. All right. A father, heavenly father who would rather protect us, correct us than to destroy us. Well, let's look at this a little further. Let's, let's see how this plays out because there's more, to be read. He says, this is what the Lord God says. Now I will restore the fortunes of Jacob and have compassion. Look at this. I have compassion on the whole house, the entire house of Israel. So look at this restore and compassion goes hand in hand. Now I want you to always keep this mind, this word in your, in the back of your mind, because Jesus was often said to be moved with compassion When he went out and saw the people, he was often moved with compassion. That word is reflective. It makes a person think back to the old covenant and say, okay, well, that that makes sense because there was a time whenever Israel needed some compassion. And it is obvious that Jesus is seeing a similarity in the people that he is serving. And he says, well, they need some compassion too. Yes, they have a history of being sinful, but... The whole house will receive compassion through me. It's when they will get to read through the Gospels as if we are Israelites. And that will change the complexion of how we interpret everything we read in Matthew to John. It is a beautiful story that shows us the goodness of God in Christ Jesus. That's that's what is, is demonstrated there. He says they will feel remorse for their disgrace and all the unfaithfulness they committed against me when they live securely in their land with no one to frighten them. 
I think at the end of the day, what all of us want is to just be left alone. At the end of the day, that's what we all want. We want a life where we don't have to worry about being oppressed or bothered. We just want to be in a position where we can do the Lord's will and do it with gladness. And before we give up hope on such a life, I want to remind you that there is there is such a life where you don't have to worry about anything, where there are no more enemies. There are no more battles. There's what the old the Old Testament prophets in the and the right of Hebrews calls rest. You see, Israel had these these uh, shifts in in experiences. When mo one moment they're fighting, they're fighting, they're overthrowing the enemy and they're trying as much as they can to clear the land and uh, gain victory over their enemies. But every now and then you would get a king who would bring rest. Where the Bible would say there, there was no more war or even a judge will have that moment where there's no battle. We've defeated the enemy. And I want us to have that hope tonight that there is a such thing where you don't have to worry about your money. You don't have to worry about, you know, your bills. You don't have to worry about um, uh, sickness and health and, and different things. God will take away the distractions. And if you can believe him for it, I believe he'll do that. I believe he will put you in a position where your mind can be focused not on the cares of this life, but on the duty and the responsibility of following Christ. Breaking glory to God. I believe in that. That's the purpose of freedom and deliverance. Have a better opportunity to do the things that God has called us to do. So notice what he says here. When I bring them back from the peoples and gather them from the countries of their enemies, I will demonstrate my holiness through them in the sight of many nations. I'm going to demonstrate my separation. That's what the word holiness means there. It means to be separate. All right. I'm different from the other gods is what he's trying to convey there. He says, they will know that I am the Lord, their God. When I regather them to their own land after having exiled them among the nations, I will leave none of them behind. When I read that, the scripture that comes to mind, I will never leave you nor forsake you. What is being conveyed in that passage? The idea that God, even whenever there is a reason to leave, he won't leave. He's going to stick right there with you. All right. He says, I will no longer hide my face from them. Catch this, y'all. Now, if this doesn't tell you when this would happen, I don't know what else we would need uh, to help us understand the time frame and the, the activities of what this was centered around. But he says in this text, I will no longer hide my face from them. But I will pour out my spirit on the house of Israel. This gives us a time frame, if not an actual date. So I'm going to when this is all done, I'm going to pour out my spirit on the house of Israel. This is the declaration of the Lord God. You see, this is the hope that those who read these words and understood the prophets had. And. When John started using the Gog Magog language, this is where their mind would have went back to. They would have said, my goodness, our deliverance is at hand. God is finally about to do it. And it is no mistake, brothers and sisters, it is no mistake that in both Revelation and Ezekiel, when you see the defeat of this foe, rather it is the nations who are conspiring or rather it is in chapter 21 of Revelation, or excuse me, chapter 20 of Revelation, Satan that is coming against the people of God. After this is done, you find a new creation, a new opportunity to dwell in God's presence. That's what you find. You find newness, freshness on both chapters, because once the enemy is overthrown, then God has an opportunity to bring in that new existence. And this is what we find in both both books. All right. So you can see the inspiration of e Ezekiel on John, who's written the book of Revelation. And in order to understand Revelation, you have to read Ezekiel next to next to Revelation. All right. So 
I pray that there's been something said um, to help understand these books. I want it to kind of draw some sort of parallels from chapter 20, but I think I, I did enough of that. I don't want to belabor a point. But it's good to read chapter 20 with Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39. You'll get the point very clearly. You'll see the parallels. All right. Well, thank you so much, guys. I'm excited. We're having um, just a reminder, September 10th at 12 o'clock. It's going to be here in Columbia. Um, and we're going to have a meet and greet. We're going to have food. We're going to have fellowship and an interactive study. And what we're going to be talking about is how to understand and share the gospel. I'm going to put myself and you all in a position to interact and find the best ways to share the gospel in any given circumstance. And we're going to choose the most common ways that the gospel is opposed. And then we're going to find how to actually share the gospel during those expressions of opposition. From this session, I'm putting myself on the line here, but I believe in God. I believe you will become far more equipped than you have been in the past to share the gospel with anyone that you can come across. It will be the beginning of learning how to really communicate the gospel in a post-modern, a post-Christian society. And um, what we're going to see on September the 10th is that the very message that we have is the very thing that everyone in the world is looking for. And we're going to find out how to share that. All right. So I'm looking forward to that. Looking forward to having the time together in fellowship. I think it's going to be a good time. Time well spent. Be, feel free to bring a friend. Register online at www.ca-ea.org. Completely free event. You don't have to pay for anything. Just show up with the right heart and mind to read and understand and share. And uh, it's going to be a great time. So until next time, thank you all for listening. Thank you for watching. Hope you have a blessed and prosperous week. Take care and God bless.